So when the panelists feel they've accumulated sufficient provocation, they can begin. <laughs> or we can... Yeah, <laughs> very nicely said. Yeah, someone. Uh, I was intrigued by a few of you returned to the word weaponization. And yet the whole event began with a quotation from the Iliad. So I'm wondering whether weaponization marks something historically new, or if you think of that as really a term that could have been used at any time, really, or if it actually, I think that's the end of my question. But is it new or is it old is basically my question about the term weaponization. Is it, does the term name anything new? Yeah, I see a panelist. <laughs> yeah. Don't know where to begin. Uh, uh, the last question, just uh, in terms of periodization of, of the weapon. We're talking about the weapon in relationship to embodiment. Uh, it's, it's Junger uh, who uh, inaugurates insight, though he's building on Simmel, uh, who talks, and Simmel talks about in his essay in 1903 on the mental life of the cities that the only way to, to survive the shock of capitalist urbanization is to, is to uh, armor the body and armor the sensory apparatus so that you can move through the city almost as if you are an armored weapon vehicle. Uh, and uh, uh, Junger picks up on that in the aftermath of World War I and talks about photography and violence as a development of a second uh, colder uh, consciousness. And then Adorno, uh, and probably there are other figures like Benjamin that I'm leaving out, but Adorno in his essay in After Auschwitz when he talks about the fact that the victims of the extermination were, were uh, exterminated as deviations uh, from the nullity of their being, you know, that they were, should never have been alive. You know, they were always thanatopolitical. He talks uh, about that, uh, that under capitalist rationality and commodification, the, compa the, the incremental expansion of the powers of objectification uh, 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 correlatively decreases our ability to feel the pain of the other. Uh, which I have written about uh, called cultural anesthesia. So weaponization does have a history. Uh, I think one of the uh, other interesting aspects of that, which was, I think, raised in reference to hunger striking, but I think in all the papers, particularly when uh, Mary Louise Pratt talks about the, rece the receipt of words as penetrating, as scarifying, uh, that what I witnessed here was not what the questions are looking at, which is the objectification of violence, uh, the representation of some type of universalized, essentialized model of violence that we could all talk about and agree on, but rather, very. I think the issue is that scenography is not uh, inadequate. Scenography is exactly where history and ontology is fragmented so that everybody here presented in this panel uh, presented diverse scenographies and regional ontologies of violence and we're focused on on violence as forms of subjectification so that the 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 moment the, the of appearance of visibility of violence is is just cannot be disconnected from the appearance of a particular type of subject and i think this really goes to what avatar was trying to show when she says that the event of violence has to transform our accepted uh, lawful conditions of recognizable possibility. The, the event of violence should bring with it unrecognizable conditions of possibility and or repressed, marginalized conditions of possibility that were silenced by programs, calculability, institution, and, and, and enforced hegemonic ontologies and phantasms. So there is no single essentialization of violence. There's no violence that we can talk about. There are regional ontologies. There are points where history begins to fracture into the anahistorical and the anaeconomical, and where hopefully new subjects begin to appear. Uh, and this is one of the dangers of, of, of the work of someone like Agamben, who talks about bare life as a life without qualities. As you know, once you're outside of law, you basically are in a space of death, and you have no qualities. You have no subject position. Uh, and I think that many, uh, all the speakers here are struggling to find what are the subject positions that emerge from situations of, of chronic uh, uh, of violence and how are people negotiating that as history, as embodiment, as sensory experience, as affect. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll 
jump in. Um, I want to try to combine these questions in a way um, in my response. Um, the first one um, about whether the experience of violence to the self uh, is similarly traumatic to the experience of violence directed at the other. Um, what, what I want to do um, is instead of comparing um, the experience of trauma, um, which I'm unable to access, um, I want to shift attention um, from the object of violence, self, other, building, whatever, um, to the subjects of violence, the subjects who are performing this violence. Um, and it seems to me that um, uh, especially in, in the kinds of violence that is dependent on the use of the body, such as hunger striking, self-immolation, uh, forms of self-killing, suicide bombing, etc., um, the subject seems to uh, be increasingly blurred into uh, the background, and the object takes a certain prominence. And we forget, uh, or we tend to forget, that there is a... Um, uh, a moral political uh, agency at work w which is making cons c conscious decisions, um, volunteering, um, which is embedded in social uh, pressures, um, aspirations, et cetera. So, um, um, and, and interestingly, when, it's, uh, when that agent is directing this violence to the self as well as the other or and or the other, um, there is a convolution, an implosion, um, an internalization um, of, of whatever violence does in its function, and, and, um, and that, of course, needs to be uh, unpacked. Um, and I think that relates to uh, the aspect of unintelligibility a little bit. I mean, when um, violence is directed at the other, it's very easy to talk about the instrumentalization of violence because you have a certain political goal that you want to achieve. You establish a power structure, as you uh, said in your question. But when um, it's directed at the self along with the other, or only at the self, that means ends structure seems to disintegrate. That instrumentalization seems to be less valid. So for instance, if one is a human weapon, um, it, it, it's very difficult to hierarchize <coughs> which quality comes first. Are you a human or are you a weapon? So I, I'm trying to work in the ambiguity uh, of that term in a way. Um, and, and I think that's related to the question of um, unintelligibility. Because we always ask, I mean, there is a certain aspect of incommensurability. Like you always ask it, is it worth it? Is it worth to sacrifice your life for this cause? Is it worth to risk your life? Is it worth to die um, in protest, say, of prison conditions? I mean, is, is it worth it? So um, um, I think uh, um, um, in that sense, in, in terms of the annulment of instrumentality, the weaponization uh, gains a different connotation. Um, um, it's not any kind of weapon uh, um, um, that is at stake. Uh, especially with the human, um, it's a it's a qualitatively different kind of weaponization, um, I think. Um, and and just a very brief comment on um, uh, the uh, uh, last question, or, or maybe the second question on the uh, Pentagon um, and the responsibility of the academic. Um, it's uh, one of the responsibilities, and this is certainly not the uh, um, uh, activist responsibility, but at least within the field of learning and scholarship, I think um, it is important to be uh, discussing the claims of people who are um, trying to express certain political concerns through violent means. Um, um, and, and try to sort of unpack them and contextualize them and raise questions about them and even critically interrogate them, uh, but most importantly, engage with them um, as moral and political agents. So I think that is an important responsibility of the intellectual or the academic 
um, that um, these sorts of, of scholarship uh, or scholarly studies tries to uh, do. Uh, to bring it to a different audience that um, would probably uh, not necessarily be involved with uh, the particularities of the struggle and try to really um, convey the voice uh, of, of uh, various, uh, say, subaltern uh, groups and, and um, uh, peoples. So that's it. Very nice. I, I, I might just add to this very nice uh, response that I think um, <clears throat> we've just heard. <clears throat> I, and I appreciate the translate, can you hear this, um, the translation that you offered? Because I do feel I was um, scatter shooting very quickly, very anxiously because um, of the limit of time. But um, I also don't, don't want to leave you with a misunderstanding about what shooting blanks, how brave and necessary and responsible that is, nor does it belong in any kind of oppositional logic to the activism that I think all of us um, um, unquestionably um, have on our resume. Um, um, I, I had a lot to say about that, but now it's suddenly, um, Okay, that it would, I, I did say this in shorthand, but to, to um, begin to, to try to pose something like a subject position, which in itself is very um, unstable and, and preliminary, just a provisional so we can talk a little bit, just to try to pose it in terms of its decimation, defenselessness, and essential downsized incapacitation is already um, to provoke or suggest a major shift in all of the bloated and blown up um, theories of subject and subjectivity that in themselves are violent and, and actually um, program violence. One could say that the philosophies, the ideals, the idealistic, the German idealism of subject pumping is in itself programming from the start the, the violent um, also um, decimation of language that allows itself to speak of weaponization. This is very important to, to have it, you know, shoot out of Ernst Jünger and um, his total mobilization of all sorts of conceptual uh, stronghold. So what I'm trying to say is that shooting blanks from a position of, I'm now going to shift to Lacanian speak, so you can do the la 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 phobic shooing if you need to, but to assume one's castration is something um, so difficult and so um, precariously engaged by anyone in, quote, power that this is what um, I wanted to start with, the fundamental impairment that, and this would be a, 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 tr and a beginning of a response to the ethical question that you, you asked of us, which is to say to begin, because violence, I mean, in my work, I try to, try to um, displace it to the question of force, by the way, because philosophy can't deal with force. Force is not, it flies beneath uh, philosophical and psychoanalytic um, radars. In fact, in German, what, how would you translate force? Is it Gewalt also? Or, yeah, that's what's weird. But force, um, maybe it's not, I don't know. I would say Gewalt. You would? Well, Gewalt is, is you, as you know, uh, oi, Gewalt, it's getting late. Um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's violence. So displacing it to force, let's say, which would also open all sorts of dossiers and what, and now in terms of policing and poli politesse, this is something that Carl Schmidt is very keyed into, which is the relationship of politeness and policing and policy. Because politeness is, has a history of extreme the extreme retention of violence. Even when you put out your hand to shake the hand of the other, it's to show that you're not armed. 
So um, politeness is a, nego a constant adjustment and, and negotiation with violence. And this is very important for, for um, what's his name, that Nazi, um, Carl Schmidt. But when I talked to um, Levi Nas, I had the honor of talking to him about politesse. Um, he said, oh, that's the only place where God still dwells. So then I went, ew. <laughs> My American response, ew. Okay, so um, when, when, so when I'm saying shooting blanks, that's not part of a violent or, or, or willful defensive buildup that the academic very often is cornered into um, building when, when constructing, when talking in an audience, you know, just bring me the Pentagonians and, and we'll <laughs> start with Homer again and try to um, figure some things out. But to begin from a position of extreme defenselessness is um, part of an effort to, to remap the very possibility of the saying. And I know that's way too fast and, and perhaps unintelligible. But I also liked what you said, that violence is an excess maybe of, of intelligibility. You know, that it's, it's um, maybe one would want to start dialectizing and think in those terms as well. What happens when things are too intelligible should that ever happen? But it reminded me that um, old man Bush used to say, you know, read my lips. And always, whenever he was about to start a major violent assault, it was always in the name of intelligibility and transparency and, and faux, um, uh, let's say, um, semantics in a certain way. So a lot of violence gets done by saying that I'm going to tell it to you plainly. That, that's a very necessary supplement to, to what I was um, trying to say in terms of unintelligibility. So I'd want to refine that and include you in the fold once you learn how to pronounce my name. Oh, <laughs> um, let me just pick up on a f couple of these things. Uh, I think what you just... Um, uh, evoked Avital is that when you're talking about war as opposed to violence, and we, it's we, they get conflated all the time, and it's, they're very obviously very different things. But uh, war requires, yes, a continual um, regime of truth to be reasserted in whose name the war is is said to be taking place, right? And uh, so that's um, just a dimension. I'm of um, the structure of meaning sustained around war. So the Pentagon, in fact, has to be worried all the time about touchy-feely shit like meaning uh, and, and pleasure, because uh, if it is not uh, maintaining a structure, it is impossible to be as absolutely uh, courageous and risk-taking as you have to be uh, in warfare without uh, being held up by an enormously um, intense structure of meaning, which can be your fraternal bonds with your fellow soldiers, but something ha very, very uh, sustaining has to be there. And um, it, actually, this was a topic taken up by um, a person who studied war in Homer. Now, since Homer got evoked, I want to refer you to two books by a writer named Jonathan Shea. One is called Achilles in Vietnam, and the other's called Odysseus in America. And Shea was a, um, a uh, um, psychologist who has worked all his life with Vietnam vets, and he also was a, trained as a literary uh, person. And uh, he, what he realized, he, in those two books, he uses the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, as studies in war and in warriordom and warfare uh, in order to, um, and, and he uses them to illuminate or brings them into connection with his ex the ex experiences of Vietnam vets uh, as they recounted it to him. And he uses both the Vietnam vets experience to illuminate those two books and vice, and vice versa. Um, so they're really um, very interesting books. So that takes me back to Martin's question about is weaponization new or old? And as far as he could tell, it's, it's old. I mean, that you can, 
the, the, the literature that the Pentagon guys write with today goes back, still uses the Chinese war manual, so there's just a tremendous amount of consistency around warfare, um, at least. Um, on the, the touchy-feely side, also interesting that you were being recruited um, by the Pentagon for your uh, knowledge of the Middle East. This is one place where the touchy-feely comes back in in a way that has been quite fascinating to me as, I, as I'm interested in language, because um, what you would find if you decided to get recruited, um, you could actually go online and look at the questionnaire that you would have to fill out to get a security clearance. And one of the things that the Pentagon runs into all the time when it comes to specifically to language and linguistic and cultural expertise is that the things that it takes, the kinds of experience that it takes for you to become, to achieve the level of expertise in the enemy's language and culture are the things that make you ineligible for a security clearance because you yourself are a potential enemy. And this is a thing that, the, this is a thing that is, it has produced a, in, the, in the Pentagon a sense of real linguistic crisis and real linguistic panic. And you see it in the media all the time when you read the stories about the, the translators and the, this and, you know, f um, Fort Bragg language school being infiltrated by some people whose documents, are, you, or the failure of translators, the murder of translators all the time, the, the zone of incredible instability and unpredictability that rests on the mediator the, the linguistic mediator in, in, the scenario, in the war theater is something that has no solution. That is, that you can't, the Pentagon can't fix it, which is what uh, the linguists have told them. You cannot fix the fact that the people who have the linguistic expertise you need and the cultural expertise you need are the people that you can't trust because the experience is required to get those things, the kind of subjectification in the other language that you have to, ha have to develop, you have to become a subject, is, is very, is, makes you un, un, unreliable. And when I speak to, um, it's interesting, I spoke to um, students in, a military, in the military lang the Defense Language Institute in Monterey one time, and I said to them, why do you guys, want to learn the language, They're being, these are American soldiers being in intensive language training in the strategic languages, right? And I asked them, why do you, I want to know what the structure of desire was around learning the enemy's language, like how do you do that? Because it takes enormous desire to learn a language. It's, it's like you have to have a motivation, it's not an easy thing to do. And so I want to know what it was, and I asked them, I said, what do you guys, how do you see it, what you're doing, that you're learning, are you learning people's language so you can go kill them? And how does that work? And there, they were very clear, their answer was immediate, no, 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 we are learning the la this language because we will, it will enable us to save innocent lives. So they had a, a structure of meaning that was, that was necessary to make it possible to, um, to engage in a weaponized language learning. Uh, I just want to, to start by uh, addressing Avital on, on two, I think, crucial points. Um, the first is that the very idea of, of grievability is very associated with the openness of yourself to defenselessness, powerlessness before the possibility of, of, of violence. Uh, and so that it's important to understand that that, that fundamental gesture of, of, of Levinas, and uh, that shall not kill, always turns on, of course, the other side, which is that at any moment we can be killed, hurt, and, and violated. Someday uh, you and I will speak about whether Immanuel Kant actually pumps up the subject, because I think he de-pumps the subject, but that's a whole other discussion. That I want to uh, emphasize that, that that point in Levinas and in, in, in Derrida also takes us to the event as, as the unintelligible because to some degree, and I, I don't think you would ever disagree with me on this, once the event has happened, it will be retrospectively given meaning. Uh, and, and that retrospective act of, of, of given, giving meaning uh, is part of... Uh, how we, in a sense, both 
continue any particular political struggle and at the same rec time recognize that it's never actually rooted in the event from which it was instigated. The classic example is no one foresaw, including the organizers of the takeover on Kennedy Road, that it was going to happen, let alone that it would lead to a shanty dwellers movement, let alone one that then would begin to try to develop an ethics of living communism out of a fighting return to indigenous ideals. That's retrospective, that's after, that's after the event. But part of what, of course, uh, an organic intellectual in Gramscian sense is supposed to articulate is both the incommensurability with the event, but also uh, the relationship of what that event stands for in whatever political context that, that it's, it's in. Uh, which is why you could never have an ontologizing notion of violence. Uh, one of the, my favorite words is struggle. So I'm very much with, with, with Avatar. The idea of, of <coughs> struggle and violence is something that oftentimes gets displaced, which again is why I wanted to begin by saying that the, the, the to the degree that Levinas or sometimes Derrida could be read as offering a nonviolent ethic should never be translated into a necessarily nonviolent politics because it could easily call you, and, and surprisingly, as it did one day on Kennedy Road, that the next thing you know you're fighting with the police. And you too, not just you know, them out there, are uh, uh, subject positions based on <laughs> rocks being thrown at you. That's us too, guys, you know? I mean, we always talk sometimes about, oh, the subject positions of those other people. As soon as somebody throws a rock in you, you've just been turned into a subjective agent and, and in Alan's sense, and you're going to, to act back in some form or another. You're either going to run or you're going to pick up your own rock. And, uh, and there you are, subjected to a position of a particular kind of agency because of a violation to, to your, your, your body. I want to say something about the human weaponry. Um, I ended... Uh, uh, my desire to speak Irish, uh, uh, with a <coughs> quote from the hunger strikers writing on the wall as they were dying, I will die for all souls, uh, uh, which is that part of that was evocation of a language that itself was seen, the very speaking of it, as violent. That's maybe my desire to speak Irish, right? You know, it's, it's my little fuck you to the English, um, um, which I can't resist, which is a violent desire. <laughs> maybe, cool. maybe they want to be violated by me, but I certainly uh, want to be invited to violate them. Uh, the same in, in, in probably learning Cosa. Uh, uh, but I think that the, the idea of a weapon, were the hunger strikers turning themselves into a weapon or a different kind of, this is what I think is so important about Alan's book, into a kind of a political symbolization of the exact powerlessness of which you are speaking. Uh, there's a wonderful movie called Hunger in which there's a 15 minute exchange of the focal point of one of the strikers who's dying with a priest who's saying it's wrong, a sin, everything to, to die. It seems to me, although I don't at all disagree with you, that you know, at times the only subjective position of a body is uh, to die. The meaning that was given to this extreme action was I will die to all souls in Irish, a language that if you spoke it in prison was enough reason for you to be uh, subjected to the most severe punishment. In fact, that is the political movement of the speaking of Irish in the prison cells has led now to a political movement. Um, but again, back to Avatel, in a certain way, the first speaker of Irish, it's not Gaelic because Gaelic includes Celtic and Welsh, the first speaker of Irish, the first one to shout out in Irish in the prison, that was n unexpected and only retrospectively uh, realigned with a, a kind of politics. So I, I, I wonder if we're really talking about human weapons, and of course this is part of, of returning to Alan's book, in a sense these may be hard men, the refusal of a certain kind of instrumental uh, weaponry, which was a, a, a kind of ideal of fighting without the, the, the weapons of modernization. Remember the boys in the shantytown 
despised the Mozambique owner because he had a gun and then went out uh, only at the, at the last resort and bought it because they, they wanted to fight it out uh, uh, in a different manner that seemed fair since he had the goods, now he also had the gun. I, I want to, to return to you know the, the Pentagon not giving a shit about what I think. Um, I'm glad. <laughs> um, I, I, I think the day the Pentagon starts reading me is the day that I'm, you should probably tell me the pod people are here and I've been snatched. Um, <laughs> on that note, though, that part of what uh, this, this defenselessness means, that you are always open to the other's call, if you are, is that you may be called to violence. You may be called to do things that you couldn't have anticipated doing, and you will only know afterwards whether it was justified. And in my own autobiography, which has many such instances, uh, I remember when I was 20, we believed that the FBI was systematically killing the Black Panther Party.